I think it's every bit as valid that we're here tonight as standing at a war memorial, quite rightly. We also have to make very clear this is not an anti-English demonstration. There were many good men who fell here. The Scots, of course, died fighting for freedom, for what they believed in. Many of the Englishmen were fighting under the feudal lords. They probably didn't have any idea why they were fighting. But nevertheless, they were fighting. A lot of them were good men. The tra tragedy of them dying was every bit as bad. So we remember them too. <laughs> then, as now, it never seems to be the common soldier that causes the wars in the first place. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm very happy to be able to introduce um, some great speakers. This site, it's a beautiful site, uh, if you can ignore the dead flowers that are behind you. But a couple of months ago, they were actually quite nice. Um, unfortunately, it has been neglected at times over the years, and sometimes there's been a wee bit sort of run down. But much more than the neglect to the sort of upkeep of the site is the fact we've had nothing here to commemorate the battle. Nothing here to say to Scots, to say to the world, this is where we made our stand, this is where we brought freedom. We bought it very dearly on the lives of our good men of Scotland who believed we should be free. It's time now to change that, and I'd like to introduce you to a friend, a man that I approached some years ago when I, I realised it was time we did something. This is Fergus Wood, he's the chairman of the Guardians of Scotland Trust that we set up to make sure the site is transformed and made a fitting memorial to the men who fell here. Fergus Wood. My fellow Scots, believe this, this is the most important commemoration of this great battle since the battle was fought. Why? because next week we have to have the courage of our convictions, all of us Scots, and vote for our freedom. And that is what we're there to do next, next week. Do not forget it. This is the opportunity... This is the opportunity that was, and the money fought for all those years ago and we are fighting for by our votes on Thursday. The Guardians of Scotland Trust, as uh, you've just heard, was set up to commemorate this battle properly. I'm ashamed to say that it's not been done until now. And we have a two-phase program. The first phase was to be un unveiled tonight, but unfortunately Stirling Council, and I'm a councillor myself, would not give us planning permission to do it until after the 18th of September. Think about that. And phase one is three beautiful stone lecterns. One engraved to the memory of uh, William Wallace, one to Andrew de Murray and one talking about the battle in general over this area here. And the centerpiece, which will be in phase two, will be, we've got to call it a work of art, but as far as I'm concerned, it's going to be a nine-foot statue of those two great guardians and patrons of Scotland, William Wallace and Andrew de Murray, standing side by side, each with a hand in the soul card. And could I just say for a second, we kind of forget about Andrew de Murray. Andrew de Murray was the great tactician. It was probably he that planned the battle. And sadly, of course, he was wounded during the battle and died as many did die of their wounds not that long afterwards. And he kind of faded into obscurity. But he was as much a part of the success of Stirling Bridge as William Wallace. And the two literally go hand in hand and they will be hand in hand when that statue goes up. We also plan to erect a, a boulder, uh, an inscribed boulder, and it's all lined up, on the site of the bridges. We know where the bridge is, about 50 metres up from the bridge here, to commemorate the actual site of the bridge. And then that will not only add beauty uh, to this site, long overdue, but it will, from a sterling point of view, it will link the three gate icons 
of Stirling that commemorate the fight for independence. The Wallace Monument just over there, Stirling Castle, which uh, surrendered the day after the Battle of Bannockburn, and of course the new Battle of Bannockburn Visitor Centre up the road there. And this will be the centre point of that. And this will be a place where people will come from all over the world. It will be a place of pilgrimage. It will be a beautiful place. And believe me, it will enhance this old bridge to a great extent. So I hope um, as we try and raise money, as we're always trying to do to do this, we've got phase one covered, but phase two, which is the biggie, to get these two statues of those two great men up. I hope that you will see fit to support us uh, in some way, preferably with cash if that's possible. Uh, but we're confident that uh, phase one will be going up shortly after the 18th of September. And uh, we'll make an announcement of that so you can come down and see these great plaques being unveiled. Uh, these lecterns and phase two the statues of those two great men uh, and I'm talking once again about Sir William Wallace and Sir Andrew de Murray the two great patriots the guys who made this country possible if it hadn't been for Wallace and de Murray would we have a Scottish nation today probably not so we thank them for that and when we go and when I go to vote next week I will be thinking of those two great men as I put my cross to say yes thank you very much As we have done for years, the Society of William Wallace has come here and commemorated the battle. And I would like to ask George Boyle from the Society to come up and say a few words. Uh, see, see, before I start, um, I would just like you to put you, just to put your hands together for the, the guy that's behind this commemoration every year. He runs it himself. Mr. Ted Christopher, ladies and gentlemen. Well deserved. The secret of happiness is freedom. The secret of freedom is courage. The bravest are surely those who have declared his vision of what is before them. Glory and danger alike, they go out and meet it. These words weren't written about William Wallace or Andrew de Murray but how very apt and befitting of them they are. On the 11th of September 1297, Patriots of Scotland stood here at Stirling Brig against the mightiest army in all Christendom, who came up to Scotland to sort out a few thousand jocks in what they thought would be a fair fight. Aye, right. When you're outnumbered nearly 41, you can't afford to have a fair fight. Before the battle, Wallace and de Murray had not been idle. By the end of August, they'd captured Inverness, Elgin, Banff, Aberdeen, Irvine, Fife and Dundee. The entire country of Scotland, north of the Firth or Forth, was in Scottish hands and they weren't about to give it up without a fight, fair or not. As you all know, Wallace and de Murray won the day and sent our would-be oppressors home to think again, at least for a wee while. Next Thursday, Scotland's sons and daughters get the chance to decide on their future. A chance we didn't get in 1707. We'll be able to walk out of our homes that day, safe in the knowledge that we'll return to our homes and our loved ones, plant our backsides on a couch and watch our latest episode of River City, knowing that we've all done our patriotic duty for Scotland. I don't watch it, honest. <laughs> Wallace, the Murray, the Bruce, the Douglas, John de Graham, these men didn't have that luxury. When they went out to fight for Scotland's freedom, they hoped and prayed to God Almighty above for the strength and courage that they'd most definitely need in order for them to have any chance to return to their loved ones. What these warriors of did, uh, Scotland did so wonderfully well with a sword, we get to do with a simple stroke of a pen. Is a pen mightier than a sword? On this occasion it may very well be. When you walk into the polling station next Thursday, don't look on it as making a political decision. Look on it as making amends, putting some things in order. Look on it as doing the right thing for Scotland, your children, and those who come after. Independence, freedom from Westminster, a chance to govern our own country and be in charge of our own destiny. Only a fool would not want that. But there are plenty of fools among us, not here, I hasten to add, brainwashed by Westminster and the media in Scotland. If we are better together, then why, why aren't we already better together? 
Freedom is best, I tell thee, tell thee true. Of all things to be won, then never live within the bonds of slavery, my son. As pertinent today as it was 700 years ago. Independence is being handed to us on a plate. Unlike Wallace and DeMurray, who on the morning of the battle of Stirling Brig, probably kissed their loved ones goodbye, never knowing if they'd return. But they did it without fear or hesitation. Scotland's freedom meant that much to those brave men, and that even the very real threat of death couldn't and wouldn't deter them. Wallace and DeMurray were men of their time. Brutal men, some would say, but in a brutal time. But their absolute insistence that no man or group should be able to dominate any other against their wishes makes them for me not just Scottish heroes, but universal ones. The freedom, the freedom that William and Andrew fought so hard to protect and which ultimately cost them their lives was given away by a parcel of rogues in 1707 when the Treaty of Union with England was passed by 110 votes to 67 with more than a suspicion that some of the poorer members of Parliament were bribed. A parcel of rogues indeed. So Sir Walter Scott summed up the attitude of the Scottish man in the street at the time in the words of one of his characters, I ken when we had a king and a chancellor and a parliament, men of our reign. We could die people on with stones when they won the good bairns, but nobody's nails can reach the length of London. Recently, uh, through the Paisley Tartan Army, myself and the guys had the chance to befriend a couple of young Croat lads who remembered their own country's battle for independence only too well. Over 20,000 dead, thousands more injured, and families who will forever suffer the effects of their loss. These lads couldn't believe nor understand why we were even having a debate about Scotland's future, and the fact that it's all been done without any bloodshed was a wonderful thing in their eyes. Makes you think, doesn't it? Another wee thinker is that if Scotland says no to independence, we'll be the first country to ever say it. Countries much smaller than ours have grabbed it with both hands, and none of them have asked to come back. Scotland's history means a great deal to me, as does its future. The wars of independence weren't fought by fictional characters in a film or a comic book. These people actually existed. They lived. They loved. They all had families and were as patriotic about Scotland as we all are tonight. Everyone recognises the sacrifice that William Wallace made for his beloved homeland, which of course ended with his shameful murder in London. William Wallace knew firsthand the sacrifice that Andrew de Murray had made for his country, as do the Society of William Wallace. For it's not just William Wallace and the men who fell at Stirling Brig that we are commemorating here tonight. We are also here to recognise the fact that Andrew de Murray laid down his life for Scotland, for our sons and daughters and the future generations of Scots. It would be fair to say that without Andrew de Murray, William Wallace might not have become the legend that he so obviously has. For Stirling Brig alone, Andrew de Murray deserves to be rightly recognised as a hero of Scotland and more than worthy of a permanent monument here on the site of his greatest victory. As Ted and Fergus have said, the, the Guardians of Scotland Trust, which I'm on it as well, I know how hard these guys have worked behind the scenes for just such a monument. But the powers that be on Stirling's council, a horrible, twisted Labour Tory love fest, don't deem it inappropriate at this particular time. It would seem that this honour will only apply in an independent, free Scotland. Personally, I'm willing to wait for Scotland to be a free, independent country. It's only seven days away, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. All the As I said before George came on, the Society of William Wallace have kept this commemoration going for many, many years, long before Braveheart made it popular to be a, a Wallace supporter, popular to be a Scot even in some people's eyes. But recently, we've managed to get a good tie-up with the guys from Och, which was the land of Andrew de Murray. The Society have been going to the commemoration at Och every year, and every year they've come down here too. And it's time we joined with them, as George has said, just to, to recognise Andrew de Murray. It gives me tremendous pleasure tonight to welcome 
to say a few words to you, John the Earl of Murray. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, it's, a, it's a huge honour to, to be asked to just say a few words here this evening uh, on this really particularly momentous uh, few days that we've got ahead of us. And, uh, 917 years uh, after the, 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 the great battle and um, I think Andrew de Murray would be amazed by two things if he, if he were uh, uh, here today. Um, firstly, I came down from, uh, as, from Murray this afternoon in uh, the comfort of my car with my with Freddie who's here somewhere, my little boy who sought for a cup of tea on the way down and it made me just think how, how incredulous he would be with the struggle that he came when he came down probably the same route as the A9 all those centuries ago, but with his men with him through the probably took him several days through the wind and the wet and staying out maybe sleeping rough and shielings on the way down. And I think he'd, the first thing he'd have been was just staggered at uh, the comfort that we all really have today and the speed that we get about the place. And of course the other thing he would have been absolutely fascinated by is, is, is the political situation that we have now in Scotland. And, and uh, I think he would have been delighted that uh, we've, we've turned um, plowsh swords into ploughshares and uh, that, 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 we, that, that the situation we have now is, is, as, as has been said, with a pen rather than a sword. And that we, we live in a peaceful country, unlike so many places in the world, so really suffering at the moment. And uh, I just want to mention just a couple of other characters that uh, uh, Thomas Randolph hasn't been mentioned. He was a, another great, great figure um, who I think is very important not to forget. And uh, also um, Thomas de Longueville, who very, very few people have ever heard of. And uh, it's a great story. Longueville Sword, who is up in Murray at the moment, which is sits in Murray. Uh, William Wallace, the, story, the old legend goes, went to France to enlist the help of the French, and he was accosted by this uh, renegade French knight called uh, Thomas de Longueville, who uh, they had a who's become a who's called the Red Fox and became a pirate in, in, in the in the Channel. And they had an almighty Rami fight and. Uh, the, uh, William Wallace got the upper hand and was about to dispatch uh, Thomas de Longueville when he thought second about it and spared his life. And de Longueville, uh, in return, swore fealty to Wallace and came back to Scotland with him and fought with him for uh, all the ensuing years. And uh, after Wallace's betrayal and thereafter for Bruce, and uh, he ended up surviving all those wars and was given uh, in Thorn's Castle just outside Perth and uh, where he apparently grew old in peace and um, died and was buried in the kirk there at Kim Thorn's and uh, his sword which is known as Wallace's sword uh, I have the great honour of, of being custodian of but uh, could have been held by Andrew de Murray could have been seen by William Wallace. Uh, it's a uh, those people, you know, that, that whole group of people, very so important for us not to forget. And uh, so, I'd just like to say a huge thank you uh, to uh, being able to speak at this very, very momentous moment in all of our lives. Thank you very much. The main reason, of course, that we've come here tonight, as we do every year, is to remember the men who fell here. I'm going to ask Irene Clark from the Society of William Wallace to lay a wreath to those who fell. She's going to lay it at the tree there, if we can maybe just make a wee. This tree, it's a nice tree, but it's what we've got at the moment to commemorate the battle. This is it. Not for long. We'll keep the tree. <laughs> Can I ask everyone just to observe?
for a few moments silence please to have your own thoughts on the carnage that happened here the men that fell to give your own personal thanks I was mentioned earlier on about next week, just the same as it was 700 years ago, not being about the day, but being about the future. And it gives me uh, great pride to introduce a part of that future, uh, making his first speech here. I'd like to welcome Mrs. Kyle Christopher. My fellow Scots, there we go, come on, I'd like to say I was unprepared, but you know, ask my dad, I'm always prepared, you know. Some of you know me as Kyle, and some of you know me as his son. Now, I told my dad I would make a speech about two weeks ago, and I didn't know what to say, I mean, I'm never really good at things like this. It was the 1st of September that made up my mind for the speech. I was on my second Facebook account, which is Kyle's Ted Son, and so on, you know. Well, I haven't been on that in over a year, so I've missed birthday messages from back in November. So I was scrolling through them, and I saw one message that particularly got me, just right here. It was Duncan Fenton. It was a simple message, it was just... Happy birthday, Kyle. But it reminded me of him, you know? So, Duncan, this, this one's for you. There's an old saying that, you know, we don't know what we have till it's gone. And this is true with friends and family. Everyone from society knows that Duncan was a great man. He helped them through tough times and he was taken before his time. It's heartbreaking, you know, that Duncan got so close to seeing this and yes ultimately so far you know, he was so close and I'm vegetarian it's, you know, a lot, not a lot of people deserved more you know, he really should have seen it Duncan was the kind of guy you know, it didn't matter how long you knew him he was a friend and you were a friend to him you know, and now with him so far away, he's the man that I wish, we all wish, we'd known just a little bit better. His message reminded me of why I love our country. This is really, really hard. He reminded me why I love Scotland. I haven't been involved with things like this for that long. 
but I've got friends for life because we're all Scots. I've got Tam and Stephanie and Gary Stewart. I've got Connie and I'd be here for hours if I was naming the rest. The point is, all of us as Scots, we're not easily motivated, but we were motivated now. And we're uniting under one, one cause. And that is freedom, liberty for a country that has been held down for too long. And I keep closing this page of piece of paper, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but what I wanted to say was, it was people like Duncan and Davy Ross, everyone else that was lost to us. They join a list, a list of great people, a list that includes William Wallace, Robert the Bruce and Bonnie Prince Charlie, a list of Scots that fought for what they believed in, that gave their lives for it. Wallace brought us to this bridge, Damori brought us to this bridge, we were brought to Bannockburn and we were brought to Culloden. Duncan brought us here, and Davy Ross brought us here. Now, Dad's bringing us here. So why don't we show him how we dance? Been upstairs for your wings. <laughs> the easiest way to follow that is to change the subject totally, I think. For those of you who are going across the road and you've not got tickets yet, Danny's got them if you've already paid for them, they're in envelopes. I'm just saying that so I didn't forget to say it later on. I'm going to introduce you to another gentleman who's on the, the Guardian of Scotland's Trust. This is Parig McNeil. Parig. Parig. Knows more about history than any man that I know, apart from maybe Davy Ross. But Davy's not with us any longer, so so I'll go with his expertise at the moment, and uh, I'll let him tell you just a wee bit about the Barlister Land Bridge. It's getting a wee bit dark, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking. Uh, I've written a 2,000 line poem in Scots and English, which you can get online, called De Murray. It's similar to Blind Harry's style, uh, the poem that uh, inspired the great movie, The Ball uh, Braveheart. <clears throat> I'm going to recite for you now the last part of the last 200 lines. The last 200 lines is the Battle of the Brig, or the Battle of Stirling Bridge. <clears throat> and if you want to know what happened in the second part, you're going to have to come to the rugby club. Because I'm going to tell you what happened to a famous rent collector. His name was Hugh Cressingham. Uh, I don't know if you're in the mood for a really, really bad joke. Would you like a bad joke before we start? Yeah. What's the difference between a neurotic, a psychotic and a psychiatrist? A neurotic dreams of living in a castle in heaven. A psychotic lives in a castle in heaven. A psychiatrist collects the rent. No. <coughs> Anyway, so this is 200 lines, um, and for those of you who buy it, you can also get it in English. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to give the 200 lines just now. If you want to know the, sec the rest of it, you have to come in. September's rain for Abbey Crag is coming, as it's the sixth the moss at Tilcloch Manon, and west the Allen's water where it meets the fourth, where sea and sank in slow retreat. But what could pierce the peace of sicker sicht? Nay brattle, but a south wind wears micht to emrit next was flags make flaying banners, and richt was claim as raymond like a hammer. For Cressingham we were in neath the brooch, but like their man awaited slow approach that Murray hoped for, as they duped in Wallace, to see the gaukish fall through wild sea flawless. For Hickrin hodden by the craggy yokels would serve to keep the fair and target focal. But just afore the blessed day would come, I wo was sent to parley to be shunned. But Stuart and Lennox free the camp to Percy, as weel as monks free they walk into mercy. We brought the message back, 
the nerves would rattle. Tis peace we are here to mark but battle. And free at least their kingdom through the peers. And skin king of England in their very beards. Then what did hear the warren but the trundle? But baggage in the rear guard in his bundles. And news it came for Percy and for Clifford that they were but a day's ride for the river. And he delivered back to them the order that they gave him this band I o'er the border. But Lord afraid of the warren, though obeyed, would cost the English sailing on one day. For Saturday's cloud, cloud curtain in the heavens would open on September a day of evens, when Saxons crossing o'er the wooden brig record would be at Warren's sleepy bid. For Stivlin Craig and Tail, it was Stivlin Brig I clasped in for to buckle, the fourth to his crescent hum would cause to stumble. For Richard Lundy roll out, sirs let me cross, we men and fit and next sir till the moss. Through Kildeen's ford are sweared in blood to bathe, for gift this brig be cross, cross, tis death you face. But Richard Lundy, a Lundy after Irwin Chongen sides, distrusted was by cressing him what chide, O oh, other guidance, ripen in thy voice. Let's cross this bridge since we have no no choice, since all in coin it's costing. So let's hammer the Scots with sword in hand, and here's our banner, hurrah! Twas twang Sir Marmaduke I stepped for it, while twa a breast and horse the face swell tore it, the trepidation ishit and emotionless, of oh, fear the pond is filled with sick devotionless. For fitman hour would follow till the bank, we moth beside the causeway fair to flunk, while next or onk the causeway felt to face the Scots, while Saxons merged at merchant pace. New Thusen's place be Cressingham's at and ground the ray were crossed, but new were trapped, when in to back them free the other side, where Warren's men would through the fecht abide. Aye, sick a sign would Murray see the light, three words that cover it crags aneath the mire, to call the church with pipemen gangin' for it, and us in a gowd and circuit torrent, rich down the causeway free as heat to tail, for twangin' all to scatter in the hail, of botchy and fleeing, peer and sparing squadrons, to face to flee we fear until the cordon, to in the hollow, by the hick forth water, to swim, our groon, our fecht, to face the slachter. Twas here so quickly, but he took the measure, or place him at the brick heed, like a hedger, a shelter him, lest some Saxons tried to cross, when call would he the wallace till the moss, while fecht and nigh twa hundred spared it hewin, and to that very beard saw life blood spewin, while horses compass trampled on their ain, to pran and panic sighin near and bain, and some escapin, o'er the brick would dive, until the fourth, where few would e'er survive, our penance, giddens, Oriflans and mud, I mingle it where we go in Saxon blood. To be continued. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you, just uh, can I ask you to put your hands together for all the speakers tonight? Thank you. I'm going to finish with a song that most of you know the story of, but I'll, I'll just quickly go through the story of it in case you don't. 2005, William Wallace was given a funeral service for the first time. 700 years after his death to the day, a thousand of us went down to London. We marched through the streets of London from the Houses of Parliament to Smithfield where he was killed. And the ancient church forgave the man the funeral service had been denied for 700 years. I was asked by Davy Ross, who organised the whole thing, if I would write a song to sing in the church. I wrote this, I'm very proud to have sung it in the church. It's a song that means a lot to me, means a lot to us here. But just to add a wee bit to that, a couple of years back, I was playing at Hamden Park in Glasgow, and a guy came up to me and said, I'm going to tell you something about that song that you don't know. I thought, that's clever, I wrote it. And he said, my brother's in Afghanistan fighting with the Scottish regiment. They've adopted that song. Every time one of them is injured, they're killed and sent home. They get together and sing this. So it's a song that spans 700 years of Scots willing to lay down their lives for what they believe in. And I always, as I'm standing on this spot, dedicate it to all the patriots who never got the chance to be here this week. For the guys who would have longed 
with all their hearts to be able just to go to a ballot box and take our country back. But tonight, I'm going to do a bit more than that. I'm going to dedicate it tonight to the future. Yesterday was the anniversary of the battle here at Stirling Bridge. Yesterday, David Rossi's first grandson was born. His name is David. His generation, or the generation we are going to hand this country to on the 19th. Did not close my eyes for the last time under Caledonian skies With my good friends gathered all around me To say the last goodbyes But I will not be forgotten In the heart of every star I still Why the sounds are high My spirit's coming home I'm coming home I'm coming home Back where I belong I'm coming home I'm coming home My spirit's coming But what they did not realize Is now I'll never go away I'm coming back to the land I love To the people I hold dear To Scotland St. Andrews and freedom I'm coming home I'm coming home Back where I belong I'm coming home I'm coming home My spirit's coming home After all this time To Caledonia skies To the country I died for So that our nation could survive Once again to stand beside The people I St. Andrews and freedom I'm coming home I'm coming home Back where I belong I'm coming home I'm coming home My spirit's gone
for the watch. I think it's been a fitting commemoration tonight. And thank you all for coming along. Especially those of you who have travelled to be here. To be a part of it. Thank you. Just a couple of announcements. Those of you who have still got tickets to pick up. Danny here has them. For those of you who are going across to the rugby club, please observe the traffic lights. I don't want them to getting squashed under the railway bridge. So please use the pedestrian crossings. Because if anybody gets squashed, you'll really put me off the night. I'm squeamish. <laughs> Absolutely. And the only thing other than that I've got to say is, if you're coming across there or whether you're going somewhere else, have a brilliant night and come back again next year. For the first commemoration of, in a free country. Thank you.